Hi, everyone. Uh, this is going to be a little bit tricky because uh, it's not always a very interesting topic, but uh, I like to call it the, the coolest industry you've never heard of. And so I'm going to give you a brief introduction into thermal management and electronics. Uh, as, as said earlier, I'm the founder of HiMet Thermal Interfaces, and we're making new types of materials for helping to uh, transfer and distribute heat in electronics. Uh, we're going to go through some trends, um, also the importance of thermal management, heat transfer materials, heat removal technologies, and a little bit about our solutions. And I'll, I'll try to keep the equations and the, the graphs and all these things out of it, so it's a little bit more interesting. All right, so uh, when, when I say thermal, <laughs> you say management. So thermal? Good, now you know what we're talking about here. All right, it all starts with heat. And heat is the unwanted byproduct of the work that our electronics do. So when you ask your computer to, I don't know, play a game for you, play music, do whatever, it starts warming up as a result of the, the work that it does. Um, and so this is something that not only is a, a byproduct, but it, it's also a bit of a problem, okay? When heat builds up too much, uh, you get issues. Um, so basically, two interesting statistics related to this. More than 50% of the electronics that fail, more than 50% are just the result of heat. Too much, too much heat over a long period of time or uh, things expanding and contracting. So um, just like if you, if you uh, let's say, if you're wearing a ring and your hand gets really hot, it's hard to take the ring off. Um, and that's because your hand is kind of expanding Metal does the same thing, and there are a lot of little components all squished together, and as they expand and contract at different rates, they tend to separate from one another, and that creates short circuits and, and breakages. Um, but not only that, uh, we found that if you reduce the temperature of electronics by 10 degrees, they'll last twice as long. So there, uh, there are all different reasons why heat needs to be uh, dealt with. But aside from that, it's estimated that roughly 3% of the total energy consumption is used just for cooling computers. So not only is it a problem, but there's also a price that we have to pay for this. Um, and for example, uh, this is a problem that large companies deal with, not just little tiny uh, phones and things like that. These are data centers. This is an artist's rendition, but these are data centers that are now being cooled underwater, okay, in the ocean. We're using the ocean itself to cool the internet, in effect. So, um, some trends that drive this. First of all, more computers, more electronics, everywhere. As you know, everything is smart now, right? Um, and that means that there's going to be lots of heat generated by all these tiny electronics. Data consumption increases. All these things are creating data and sending it somewhere. And it's estimated that by 2022, which is this year, uh, the gigabyte equivalent of all the movies ever made in history will cross the US IP network every three minutes, okay? So there's a, lot, there's a lot of heat being generated by all this data. And the third thing, because we have all these computers, everything is connected, the Internet of Things is going to be like producing both hardware and the data. So um, basically 64% of that, though, as of right now, is also just machine to machine. So it's devices talking with other devices. So now let's get into heat transfer at the hardware level. So here you see uh, a, a heat source, which is like a computer chip. You can just imagine a little piece of, uh, little piece of metal that's get, getting heated up. Okay? And on the other side, you see a heat sink. Usually, the way you get rid of heat is by just radiating it out into the air. Okay? Uh, that anybody who has like a desktop PC, a big box, if you've looked inside, you notice it's mostly air. And that's where the heat goes. It goes from the chip into the sink, and then goes off into the air, okay? No, it seems simple, right? Uh, unfortunately, it's not that simple. <laughs> just, just that little tiny gap between those two components can cause, or can, can make all the difference. So, and in that case, contact is key. 
In order to make the best contact between two hard surfaces, engineers need to do something about the roughness and the unevenness. If you look at them under a microscope, you'll see there's all these little rough surfaces, kind of like sandpaper almost, and that creates an insulation barrier. So this is the first thing that you need to take care of, which is the contact between components. And there are a number of different ways of doing that, different kinds of tapes, pastes, putties, gels, just imagine like toothpaste. They put materials like this in between these components to help to allow that heat to transfer and get rid of the air gap. But at this point, it's, it's getting more intense. There are more and more things causing heat, and the heat is getting higher and higher and higher. So they're using more complicated hardware to get rid of that heat. Exhibit A. Okay. Cell phones, they, they just don't make them like they used to. All right? At this point, our phones are almost a solid chunk of electronics, as you've noticed. An iPhone is now, it looks like a piece of glass. It's, it's amazing. And they've developed quite a bit over the last 45 years or so. This phone is more than 45 years old. So it's not only important to move heat into a heat sink or some kind of device to help move heat out, it's important to move that heat through the electronics altogether, because we're, we're crunching these electronics down, we're reducing the amount of space, we're getting rid of the normal airflow that's there. So, uh, as I was just explaining, that we have an increased power density, miniaturization, weight restrictions, and cost reductions. All these things are pushing engineers and designers to come up with new cooling solutions that help to deal with volume, weight, cost, and complexity. But they're at odds with one another. They're, they're, they're fighting one another. Designers say, I want this. Engineers say, no, it, it has to be bigger. <laughs> we can't cool it so well. And just for reference, though, that cell phone you saw, that one, that cost 4,000 US dollars in 1973. It had a 20-minute battery life, and it weighed almost a kilogram. So you can see we've made some pretty amazing advances in, in uh, heat transfer and uh, thermal management. So how do we do that right now? Right now, we're using things like immersion. So you can put a, a whole server, which you could just imagine it as a big computer. You can submerge that into a tank of liquid, and it will boil. And that boiling helps to get rid of the heat. And there are all kinds of other things. We can't really do that with our cell phones. But instead, we use things like cold plates, heat pipes, which are tiny tubes of liquid to help move heat around inside your phone, which has almost no air in it. It's practically just a solid chunk of silicon. And uh, vapor chambers and heat spreaders. So heat spreader is uh, very interesting because it's very flat. It doesn't take up much space, but it can still move a lot of energy. And they typically work by redistributing that energy, by changing the direction, okay? And this, this actually is very important, especially with devices that are in contact with your skin. Medical devices in particular are sensitive to this. And considering electronics on the inside can go well above 100 degrees Celsius, well, you, you wouldn't want to put your hand into a, a boiling water, would you? In the same way, you wouldn't want to hold a phone that's over 100 Celsius either. So the general purpose of these things are to avoid uh, those components from overheating and to sort of protect us from contact with them. Now, our material uh, tries to address a few of those concerns. So the surface is rough, right? So we made our material soft and wet. It conforms to the surfaces, and it also adjusts to the, uh, to the roughness. Uh, but it also spreads heat very, very well. It redirects the energy. And so uh, what does that look like, practically speaking? In one of our applications, we were able to just completely replace one of those heat sinks, okay? And that means that you can make the device smaller, lighter, less expensive, all right? So the idea is to enable these devices to continue doing what they do, but in a completely new way. Another example of where you can use uh, this kinds of materials is in battery packs, okay? This is actually a battery pack, uh, a piece of a battery pack from a Tesla cell, uh, sorry, a, a Tesla pack. And uh, the blue, whoop, you can barely see the laser, but the blue is basically fluid moving around the outside of it in pipes. But there's very little surface 
of those pipes in contact with the battery. So how do you remove extra heat? Well, example A, our, our material is a way to make better surface area uh, contact between the batteries and that uh, fluid channel. So that's, that's the, the basics of heat transfer and uh, some industry trends and a little bit about our, how our material works. Right now, we are conducting proof of concepts with several different companies and uh, have a little pilot study running in Poland. And if anybody's <laughs> interested in, in some solutions to their hot electronics problems, we are happy to, uh, to discuss it further. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, a round of applause for you.